Number 10, One Dumb Diver. This first story is from Reddit user One Dumb Diver, and boy does he live up to his name. His first mistake was heading out for a 90 foot dive alone, but he was just 15 years old and thought how bad could it be. He needed to clear his head so he headed out on his family's boat to the reef. While floating down at 90 feet, second mistake, he was only rated for 60, he saw a 3.5 meter mako shark. Mako sharks according to the diver only have two speeds, curious and lunch mode. Guess which mode this guy was in. Divers now use electronic pulses to freak out sharks, but he was using the older method of a chainmail sleeve. They bite the metal, they think, ugh, gross, swim away. But mistake number three, he forgot the sleeve on his bed at home. Shark bit down, there was now an open gashing wound in the water and salt was burning his flesh. Mistake number four, he had drifted a quarter mile downstream from his boat. Luckily, he made it to shore and 172 stitches, physical therapy to repair his tricep, and some crazy scars later, this deep sea diver never made the same mistakes ever again. Number 9. Funny from the outside. Okay, this one is scary and funny at the same time, and yes, it also involves sharks. Sometimes fear of the thing itself makes you do some pretty weird things to avoid it, which eventually makes the worst thing happen. Reddit user NZ Viking Rugger has to wear eye contacts, which makes swearing a mask even more of a necessity. The idea of going without them surpassed any other fears, even as a shark headed straight for her. While on a dive, a friend behind her had collided with a shark and her mask was knocked off. She couldn't stop thinking about the fact that her mask was knocked off, that even as a shark headed straight for her, she was she was more afraid of that. Usually sharks are more curious than anything and usually they just shoulder bump you as they turn at the last minute, but this one wasn't. She was beelining for Viking. She kept calm though and at the last second the shark was about to knock her mask, the diver just headbutted the shark in the nose. She may be the only person to ever headbutt 11 foot shark because she was afraid she might lose her mask. And she's alive, so good for her. Number 8. Food poisoning. I, I can't think of a worse time to get food poisoning than like while scuba diving. Actually, I probably can. There, there's probably something worse, like I don't know, in front of like your crush or something like that. But um, this one is definitely up there. Reddit user some guy twelve recounts the moment. He had to deal with seeing yesterday's lunch on a deep sea dive. He was 14, a relatively new diver, and just hit 20 meters below the surface with his dad and brother. About 45 minutes out, a foreboding churning began in his stomach. And, well, he started to upchuck into the water. The worst part is that the fish surrounding him thought it was lunchtime. <laughs> And they were like, whoa, look, sandwiches. No one was within arm's reach, so he had to keep clearing his regulator, puke, and then repeat until he was like, all clear. No one noticed, and he just kept on with the rest of the dive. <laughs> I am as horrified as I am impressed with his perseverance, but like dude, go over to the service. That's enough. Number seven, shark rescue. Being a rescue diver means you often have to put yourself at risk in order to recover people who got themselves into trouble. Keith Ba is a rescue diver in the Bahamas and he was on a mission to find a missing diver. He was submerged in the infamous blue hole in the Bahamas and finally caught a flash of the diver's watch on his arm. He started swimming to the bottom and began to notice that the bottom was moving. An entire school of sharks were swimming right over the body. It was breeding season and there were so many sharks he couldn't see the bottom. He found the diver though and as quick as he could began swimming up to the surface. Thing with diving though is if you rise too quickly you could get something called the bends aka decompression sickness. The shark started following him and when he reached 70 feet he had to take a break to adjust and therefore spent 8 minutes surrounded by a school of sharks with a dead body in one hand. Ugh, like how he got out of there without turning into shark food is pretty astounding. Number six, shipwrecked. Tom Pritchard had over 1,000 dives under his belt, was known for being incredibly detail oriented and cautious. Nothing should have gone wrong, but of course, something did. Just what remains a mystery. Pritchard was working on attaching a mooring line to the Andrea Doria. The Andrea Doria is a shipwreck 300 miles outside of New York. When the line was attached, the other crew members explored the wreck before rising 75 minutes later. But 
where was Pritchard. The Coast Guard swept the area but no one was found and in the end, the captain ordered the crew not to return to look for him. After all, they had no idea how he disappeared so going back down there could be even more dangerous, they could lose more people. The Doria has always been considered dangerous and has claimed 15 lives previously. As the years go on, the wreckage continues to get less and less stable. But whether Pritchard was trapped by the ship or died due to equipment failure, no one will ever know and it just is no one will ever know. Number five, Snake Island. The problem with deep diving is that if there is a problem, you can't just rush up to the surface or you might literally explode internally decompression sickness. So staying calm is paramount, but it's not always enough. Three divers decided to take on a 180 meter dive in Snake Wall in the Georgia Strait. One of the men stayed in the shallower area while the other two decided to dive as deep as they could. While they were down there, something happened, something went wrong, and while the second diver almost made it to the surface, he too perished as well. They were experienced divers, they wouldn't have been able to go in there if they weren't. So just exactly what happened to the two at the bottom still remains a mystery because it could have been as simple as an equipment failure but there's no proof. Number four, they checked no. There is a reason why high risk activities require you to sign and fill in a waiver or consent form. They ask about your health because you or someone else could be put at risk because of it. This one diver decided to check no on the form when it asked if they had epilepsy. Flash forward to a seizure attack in a pitch black cavern. 85 feet below the water. In this story submitted by Reddit user Sharkbite, they noticed one of the diver's lights weren't moving. After heading over to see what was wrong, they noticed that the diver had no regulator in their mouth, which is the breathing apparatus, and their eyes were completely checked out and their teeth were clenched together. They forcibly purged the air into their mouth with the regulator, which moved their cheeks enough to indicate air was going in. That was good enough for them. The rescue diver then grabbed their arm and swam up straight 60 feet to get them to surface, risking the bends. Once to the shore, the rest of the team helped get their gear off, and though in shock, the diver recovered like nothing happened. Thankfully, they were only 10 minutes into the dive, otherwise they would have both ended up sick. The rescue diver was put at risk, shooting up to the surface to save them both and said they would do it again if need be. And I mean, I would too, but like, boy, would I be pissed. Hopefully this person didn't discover that they have epilepsy below the water. That could be a thing too. But if they knew and didn't say, Ooh, someone's gonna get a stern talking to, wow. Number three, Sanctum. Even the most experienced divers can encounter deadly complications on dives. And to this day, no one knows what brought Agnes Maloka down. Agnes was a stunt diver who had a fierce desire for underwater exploration. By age 29, she'd been featured in multiple documentaries and even acted in the movie Sanctum. But while on a dive in the tank caves in Australia, even her expert navigational skills were no match for the sinkholes, caves, and silt. Somehow she became separated from her diving buddy and silt from the cave walls disrupted her vision. If you breathe too hard, the air bubbles would pop and disturb the ceiling and it would come crashing down. The following day, they found her body 500 meters from the entrance of the cave. Evidence suggests that she remained calm until her last breath, but no one knows what the exact reason was for her struggle. Could have been she ran out of air. Anything could have happened, but either way, she lost her life. Number two, Plura Caves. Norway's Plura Caves used to be a spot where experienced divers would test their metal, but ever since this incident, they have been closed indefinitely. In February 2014, several divers prepared to make the long trek to the other side of the cave, but 135 meters down, they lost two of their members. One member, Jari, got stuck halfway in a narrow passage, which caused immediate panic. That far down, that's a very dangerous thing. Fellow diver Patrick handed him an extra cylinder to prevent hypercapnia, which is excessive CO2 in the bloodstream, so like hyperventilating, but Jari panicked while switching and he drowned right in front of Patrick's eyes. Can't imagine that. Patrick did everything he could to stay calm and had to keep moving, but behind them, divers Kai and another man named Jari were due for a shock. Jari saw the body of Jari and panicked, even though Kai tried to help him, and sadly, Jari succumbed to the same fate. With the passage now fully blocked, Kai had to trek 11 hours back the same way he came all the way to the start. Two months later, Patrick and Kai I went back secretly to recover their friends in which they succeeded but no one else is allowed in those caves ever since then. Number one, Dion Dreyer. 
And last but not least, the tale of Dion Dreyer. If this story doesn't haunt you, I don't know what will. Dion passed away in 1994 when his body was lost 270 meters in Bushman's Hole, South Africa. For 10 years, his body remained there, but extreme diver David Shaw decided it was time to bring him home. But the dive went nowhere near as expected. With Shaw's experience in situations like this, there wasn't a doubt in anyone's mind he'd be okay. Shaw assembled a team and made the descent 270 meters down to find Dryer. But when Shaw tried to put the body in a body bag, the skeleton started floating due to the wetsuit Dryer still wore. At those depths, any panic or disorientation could be deadly, and indeed it was for Shaw. As he wrestled with the body and began his ascent, his light got snagged and he panicked because he already overexerted himself. Dave eventually passed out, and before long, Bushman's Hole claimed his life as well. But almost poetically, the two bodies floated up to the surface together. Shaw made sure he fulfilled his mission even with his last breath. Now, at number four is the painting. This one's from Reddit user Fonzie327, who said in his junior year of college, he moved into a house with his best friend. They started moving their boxes into the house and put a bunch of things in the basement. Now the basement itself was basically this unfinished concrete square that contained a smaller room inside of it that had the water heater and other pipes in it. Now the boys started looking around and started checking out what's already there and they found a huge painting in the smaller room. It's about three feet tall and when they turn it around they see the creepiest thing ever. The painting is of a guy wearing a pink onesie and the hood has bunny ears on it. He's holding a knife in his hand that that's pointed at his own stomach, kind of like he's about to stab himself, and of course he's got the biggest smile on his face ever. Now I get art is subjective and fair enough, I don't have the right to be like, that's creepy, but here's the mic drop moment we're waiting for. Now they realize the boy in the painting is being painted from the inside of the smaller room, looking onto the rest of the basement. The doorway he's leaning on is exactly the same as the one in the basement, and so they were like, hell no, we're getting out of here, and they probably just broke their lease. That's what I would do. To be honest. At number three, the Urban Explorer. Our friend here, who we'll call Jeff, had a knack for exploring that which is now abandoned. I don't know why, but when things are abandoned, there's usually a good reason for it. And in this case, it was probably what this guy found in the basement. So the story goes Jeff here and his pal Josh went venturing into an old abandoned farmhouse about an hour from their hometown. Rumor had it this farmhouse was once used for a cult, so you know things were gonna get weird. At first, when they walked in, Josh found a photo of the family who the two explorers believed used to live there. However, their faces in the photo were scratched out. Weird. As the two went downstairs, Jeff making his way down the old creaky wooden stairs would find himself going right down to the basement floor as the fifth step from the bottom caved in. It took a moment for Jeff to realize what had happened. He was standing in a basement with water up to his ankles, as well as cuts and a ton of splinters in both legs. The agonizing pain started to spread up to Jeff's torso, and he started to feel dizzy. Before he blacked out, Jeff surveyed the basement and believes he saw a face and some movement in a dark corner. Upon waking up, he found out that Josh had called 911, which was the right call. Jeff needed to be vaccinated, stitched up, and get the splinters taken out of his legs. To this day, he doesn't know what he saw in that basement, but I don't think he'll be going back anytime soon to find out. Number 10, Ghost of the Dead. This worker said, we had a younger man a few weeks ago who passed suddenly. One night after closing up and hitting the lights, we walked towards the back hallway. As I looked down the hall before heading out the door, I saw a man with dark hair and a dark suit at the end, just standing there. I thought it was a director, and when I blinked, he was gone. The director with me that day was in a light gray suit and had blonde hair. The next day, I went to close the casket in the chapel. Lo and behold, it was the same gentleman that was in the hallway the day before. Two of my coworkers said they experienced similar events, such as when walking past his casket, they felt they bumped into someone, but no one was there. That is creepy, I'm telling you. Ugh. Number 9. Stolen Body Julie Mott, who lost her life battling against cystic fibrosis, left behind a mysterious case post her death. While the funeral should have been a part of the grieving process for her friends and family, the funeral was the start of a new nightmare. Sometime after the visitation and just before closing of the funeral home, someone took Julie's body. Yeah, they just left with it. The police and family were stunned to hear this for no one knows who actually stole the body. Theories of an obsessive unidentified boyfriend, involvement of the funeral home itself have been formed, but it is still unknown as how and where did Julie's body disappear. Now this is scary and just sad. How can someone disappear with a dead body and no one noticed? Number 8. 
ghost lady. This worker said, most nights as we were returning to quarters from a run, my partner and I would scope the parking lot for vagrants or people who shouldn't be there before we open the bay doors. While looking on more than one occasion, we would see a light on in the adjacent building on the top floor, and there should have been no lights on. Figuring someone had gotten inside, we would watch the building for more lights. No other lights ever came on, but on every occasion, a young woman in a dress would come to the window and stare at us. One night after seeing the figure, we got brave and called some law enforcement friends from the area to help us search the building. We went to the room that had the light on expecting to find a vagrant camped out there, but the only thing we found was a room that had untouched dust on the floor and no light bulbs in the sockets. We got the willies and split, and we never went back to that building at night. Yeah, I would never go back to that building, ever. Like, that sounds... Terrifying. Number seven, missing head. In July 1986, Anthony Parisi passed away at the age of 83. Anthony, a co founder of a grocery store in Mount Vernon, New York, died of natural causes. He was sent to a funeral home, and on July 26, the employees of the funeral home went to prepare him for his burial, but when they looked into his casket, they discovered that his head was missing. Yeah, just his whole head, just poof gone. The police were called and they speculated that someone broke into the funeral home during midnight and used a razor or scalpel to remove the head. Once the head was cut off, the intruder took it with them. Nothing else in the funeral home was stolen or perturbed. There weren't even signs of break-in. The police were baffled by the case and they have no idea who stole the head, why it was stolen, and they don't know what happened to it because it was never found. Number 6. Spirits of the Dead This online user said, My my grandpa was a mortician for a small town in the late 60s. The morgue was attached to the house that my mom lived in. One day, her boyfriend, Tom, came over to the house and no one was home. They'd been dating for a while and he was comfortable going inside and waiting for my mom to come home. On the way into the house, Tom noticed that the door and windows into the morgue were open, so he checked it out, found it empty, closed everything, and went into the house. A few minutes later, he heard a loud slamming noise come from the morgue, so he ran to see what was wrong and found that the doors and windows had been thrown fully open again. He got out of there real quick, and when he told my grandpa about what happened, my grandpa just calmly explained that they had picked up a deceased woman that morning and the spirits were welcoming her and visiting with her. Next time, Tom should just leave the doors and windows open. Number 5. Doppelganger. This worker says, I was once working at a mortuary and had to pick up a man from the medical examiner's office. When you do that, at least where I'm from, you get the receipt when they release the body to you. The receipt has all the personal belongings that are with the deceased. When I brought the man back to the office, I opened up the body bag to make sure all the belongings were there and double checked the receipt. When I opened up the bag, I was stunned to find this dude looked almost exactly like me. He was my age, had similar tattoos and similar spots, had the same long hair I do, even had the same style of jewelry I was wearing. It took me so off guard that I stood there in an accidental crisis until the embalmer came in and was like, hey, how's it going? Ah, holy sh, that guy looks like you. It's the only case I've had nightmares about that I'll be the one in the body bag with the deceased man opening it up. Now that sounds absolutely horrifying and I can't imagine that happening. Number four new home. A family bought a funeral home and turned it into a house, which like, why? But this is what the father said of the experience. Many people that have worked here or rented have told me about hearing sounds and seeing black shadows during all hours. One of the things that turned me to wonder about all of this even more is the children saying things about a black fog in different rooms during the night. It's apparent that something is causing all of this, whispers in the hallway, lights going out and coming back on, leaving rooms with lights on and seeing them turn off, even water turning on and off. Finally, when people remodeling came to me and said something about a high-pitched drilling noise from the basement one afternoon, I told myself and my wife I'd humor everyone and speak with a local psychic. I did so the same afternoon of the drilling, and the psychic was a nice lady, but I was frustrated that all she kept saying and insisting to me was that I shouldn't remodel and stir up the spirits in the building and I am causing nothing but problems some people in the community would choose to forget. Before the phone call ended, I remember very well the last thing she 
she said, you sir are playing with fire. So after a few days, I called a local Christian preacher who prayed for me and claimed I was involved in a demonic process and should come to church Sunday morning before it's too late. He did finally come over to the building and did some water sprinkles of whatever it is called around the place, but when he left, everything started freaking out. Lights would turn off and on, and we would start getting lightheaded sometimes when we walked through areas of the building. So now, ever since that day, my wife won't stay in a room alone when we are here. We still don't really have any clear answers on the building, the items inside, or its terrible history, but after we finish remodeling, we hopefully clean and rid ourselves of the spirits of Jacob's funeral home. Now, this is literally the beginning of a horror movie, and they should move out. Like, right now. Number three, peeking from the hallway. This is a story about someone's childhood experience. They said there aren't many options in my town for funeral homes, so almost everyone in town has been to all of them at some point in their lives for service. I remember as a child sitting on a chair in the lobby of one of the more prominent funeral homes bored out of my mind during a visitation for a distant relative. A kid I knew from school walks up and says hi, and we start to chat when something catches my eye. Far down the hallway, going into a closed off area of the funeral home, I see the hands of an old man come around the corner and grasp onto the wall. Slowly, the old man peeks his head around the corner and just stares blankly down the hallway into the visitation room. I'm thoroughly weirded out and I look over at my friend who is staring down the hall. He turns to me and says, what is he doing? When we look back, the man is gone. I'm sorry, but the image of that is absolutely terrifying. I hate it. I have goosebumps. No, no. <laughs> He continued on by saying, we didn't ever really talk about it again until 20 years later when I got a call from my old friend out of the blue. He says this is going to sound crazy, but do you remember the old man at the funeral home? It was a little hazy on it, but I did remember. He continues to say, well, I was just there and my daughter saw him. During the viewing for my uncle Bill, she came over and asked my wife why the creepy man down the hallway was staring around the corner at Uncle Bill was staring around the corner at Uncle Bill, and there wasn't anyone there, man. I could hear the fear in his voice, and I instantly got chills. I have been back to that funeral home many times now, and I've not seen anything else, but I still get uneasy anytime I walk past that hallway. And yeah, that makes sense. Number two, body moved by itself. This online user said my neighbor a while back before I moved in was a mortician. One night he had a body he was preparing for a very early morning wake or service. Whatever was going on, it was unusual and it required him to work in the wee hours in the morning on this particular corpse. So as he's working on it, he turned his back to grab some tools or supplies and the angle he was standing at with regard to the corpse left the body visible just out of the corner of his eye. As he was looking down at whatever tools he was getting, in the corner of his eye, he saw the body slowly start to sit up. His fight or flight instinct immediately kicked in and he ran to the stairs as fast as he possibly could, but he was so clumsy trying to get up the stairs, he tripped and was pretty much crawling and clawing his way to the top. He was just near the top before his senses finally came back and he knew it was rigor mortis. He collected himself and started to laugh at how absurd it was. He'd been doing this for 15 to 20 years at that point and he had never had a freak out like that before where, where instinct took over knowledge and experience. He actually sheepishly admitted he had to go clean himself because he had soiled his pants in a panic. Dead bodies do weird things, I'm telling you, but I would probably have to change my pants too if that happened to me. And coming in at number one is waking up. This is a story a user posted online saying, when my cousin was 18, he was in a bad wreck and he, his girlfriend and his sister were all pronounced dead at the scene. The police arrived to inform my aunt, his mom, and she asked that he be sent to a specific funeral home. While they were preparing to embalm him, he raised up and asked, where the hell am I? Yep he wasn't actually dead. The funeral director said it was the first time he had ever had to go home and change his pants. I should add that the top of his head was open and his brain was exposed. He was sent to the hospital and the same police officer came to my aunt's to tell her he was not dead, but in the hospital. They thought he'd be in a vegetative state. But a few weeks later, he walked out of the hospital. He has horrible headaches on occasion, but he's led a successful life and he's a great guy. I mean, what a positive turn of events, 
but that would be so shocking. It's one thing for the body to move on its own, but speak, that's on a whole new level. First up in our number 10 spot, we have the nice couple. One night, a man was hitchhiking across the US and he got into a car with a couple. They seemed pretty nice, nothing out of the ordinary. Not a long while though, after when the man had gotten home, he saw the couple on the news. Apparently they had killed a man earlier that day and they were driving with a corpse in the car. <sighs> Not only that, but they had robbed and killed a few men prior to this day, leaving this man with his mouth hanging open. This is why I have never and will never hitchhike. In our number nine spot today, we have The Cousin. This is a story that comes from Reddit user Grusselig, and it is a story about their cousin. Basically, back in the 70s, their aunt's eldest son was known to hitchhike quite a bit throughout New Brunswick. One summer, unfortunately, however, he ended up going missing. To this day, he has still never been found despite police investigation. It is believed that the most likely case is that he was doing his regular thing of hitchhiking, but ended up getting into the car of someone who had terrible, sinister intentions. They believe that he likely got in the car of someone who ended up taking his life, and they believe that they may have placed his body in the St. John River. The storyteller heard this story many times growing up from their mother in order to discourage them from taking up the practice themselves. I think it's safe to say that it probably worked. Next up in our number eight spot, we have the Walmart hitchhiker. This is another one that makes me shake in my booties. And I'm not even wearing booties. <laughs> this is a story that happened to a friend of a friend of mine. 90s babies, please someone for the love of God get this reference. This is a story about a sweet, sweet old man named Henry who lived in the same town as the Reddit user who told the story. So first off, that just makes this way more frightening. It's one thing to hear these stories, but to know someone firsthand, terrifying. Anyways, he was known to be genuinely sweet and caring, and so you can imagine the shock it brought to the town to hear what happened to him. One night, he picked up a hitchhiker just outside of town. He apparently told the hitchhiker to jump in in the bed of the truck and that he would drive him to the closest Walmart. But of course, as you can probably tell where the story is going, the hitchhiker proceeded to sh the old man in the back of the head for no reason at all. Yep, after further investigation, the hitchhiker didn't steal anything, so there is seemingly no reason. Henry thankfully did not die from this, as you would think, but he did suffer major brain damage and he is sadly permanently disabled. Is it possible that the sweet old man had enemies? Or do you think he actually was sh for no reason? Leave a comment below and let us know what you think. In our number seven spot today, we have, he was a nice guy. This story comes from the Reddit user Raccoon Yeti Kiwi. And they explain that this hitchhiking story starts off when they were in the car with their dad driving. Their dad stopped to pick up a hitchhiker, but when you hear how this guy looked, you'll be just as confused as I am as to why they stopped to pick this man up. They explained that he was picked up while it was raining, that this man had long hair that covered his eyes, and that he was carrying an axe. I don't know, I wouldn't, would you? Turns out though, the guy was super polite, they just dropped him off where he needed to go, no questions asked, everyone was all good. Maybe he was just a nice guy and didn't realize how menacing carrying an axe was. I don't know. Coming up in our number six spot today, we have the clown. As the story goes, a teacher that lived in Cook County, Illinois, was walking around his town when he was offered a ride home by, as he described, a largish man. While driving, he noticed a clown suit and a giant makeup kit in the back seat. When he inquired about it, the man said that he was a part-time clown. Naturally, why else would you have a clown suit in your car? Well, a few years later, this teacher found out that this man was actually John Wayne Gacy Jr. Yep, the clown murderer himself. I remember when I was a kid, I had a friend that was so scared of clowns and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what a baby. <laughs> but now as an adult, I'm like, yeah, hell no. Nah. <laughs> They're very creepy. Apologies to any clowns watching Hollywood and murderers have done you dirty. I'm sure you're nice people. In our number five spot today, we have, I didn't know. So this story comes from someone who has a hitchhiking background. Like they used to hitchhike in their youth and now themselves they have begun picking up hitchhikers. You know, they get the lifestyle is all I'm trying to say. So fast forward to current times, this story is one that they recall as their strangest hitchhiking experience. And it's one where they're picking up a stranger as one does. So basically he picked up this guy who was walking in the middle of the desert, apparently while he was doing long haul trucking. It was the time of year where the weather is just 
just absolutely unforgiving, and that's definitely part of the reason why he picked this guy up. So he picks him up, the guy gets in, and together they travel for about 300 miles before they end up getting pulled over by the police. After being pulled over, this guy ends up getting arrested. Turns out that this guy had some sort of warrant, and the storyteller almost got charged with aiding and abetting a criminal. In the end, especially since he was a completely innocent third party, the storyteller ended up getting sent off on his way, and apparently the hitchhiker was also released not too long later. Wonder what he got arrested for. In our fourth spot today, we have the tough brother. This story is told by the victim's brother. Apparently one night, his brother picked up a hitchhiker after a long night of drinking. Probably the worst time to pick up a hitchhiker, am I right? Out of nowhere, the hitchhiker pulled out a and proceeded to tell the brother that he was stealing his car. The brother was quite tough and into heavy lifting and such, and so he thought, you know, he could take him. He then tackled the hitchhiker, only to be shot in the bicep. A big chunk of his bicep was blown off. The hitchhiker was caught by the cops, hooray, but unfortunately, the brother can no longer do heavy lifting. In our number three spot today, we have a close call. This is a Reddit story that comes from the user A Brutal Cow, and they wrote, quote, Not my story, but my dad's. He was traveling through Arizona on his way to Mexico. He looked to the side of the road and saw a man hitchhiking. My dad pulled over and asked where this guy is going, to which the man said, The next town over. My dad, being a very trusting man, and this being the 70s or 80s, decided he would give him a ride. While they were driving, they started talking, and my father asked for his name. His name was Derp. My dad, quite shocked, looked at him and replied, holy crap, that's my name. They had a few small conversations and at the next town, my dad let him out and continued to Mexico. He eventually reached the border. He pulled up and the border official asked to see his license. He took a good long look at his license. The official then took off his big aviator sunglasses and told him to pull over to the side. My dad got out of the car and they put him in a room while they searched his car. In the end, the dad was sitting in a room waiting for the next few hours and when the officer walked back in, he received quite a shock. The officer apologized for the long wait and then explained that the man that this dad had picked up had a warrant out for his arrest. The dad asked what the warrant was for and the officer replied, Homicide. Coming up in our second spot today, we have the You Are Pretty Man. Okay, this story is such a cause for anxiety for me as it deals with potential assault, and this is the first reason I would never pick up a hitchhiker. The second would obviously be fear of being murdered, naturally. The story is told by a woman who was reflecting on her experience of being 18 and driving home from her lunch break. She spotted a 50 year old man looking to hitchhike, and her first instinct was to ignore him. But then guilt flooded upon on her as she remembered her mom and how she would always stop to help people. So she turned around and asked the man if he needed help. He immediately thanked her and said he had some groceries and meat that he didn't want to go bad, so he was very grateful for her. He asked her to drop him off at the post office nearby. So she began driving, and it wasn't even a minute before she noticed that he was just staring at her. Alarms went off in her head. He blurted out, you sure are pretty, and then proceeded to ask her for her number. She told him no, and that she has a boyfriend, but he continued to persist. She asked him to please stop, but he got more and more aggressive. She slammed on her brakes and yelled, is it too much to ask for a little good karma every now and then? Get out of my car, you cad. Yes. She said cat. <laughs> he must have been taken aback by the reaction, but he ended up staring blankly at her and proceeded to get out of the car, much to her surprise. He forgot his groceries, and there was actually no meat in them, which just creeped her out even more. I was sure the story was going to have a much worse ending than that, but still super nerve wracking for anyone to have to endure. In our number one spot today, we have kindness goes a long way. Okay, so this is actually a wild story, and it happened to someone's friend who is named Nikki. Apparently, Nikki is just one of those like insanely sweet people who is just like a ray of sunshine and lives her life with kindness first. That is exactly what led her to one day pick up a hitchhiker. Apparently this guy was a little shy at first but was extremely polite and throughout their trip the two got to talking and actually got on pretty well. They ended up taking a pit stop at one point to grab dinner and she happily paid for them both. Apparently when she paid he seemed a little flustered and awkward but part of their conversation was about how he was pretty strapped for cash, hence the reason he was hitchhiking in the first place, and since she wasn't in the same boat, she had no problem treating them both. When she dropped him off, he asked Nikki for her phone number so that potentially sometime in the future they could catch up. She excitedly passed her number along, stoked at the idea of one day being able to catch up with this new friend. After about a week since she dropped him off, Nikki did receive a phone call from her new driving friend. This guy says to her on the phone that she should
should be glad she was raised to be so kind because when he initially got in the car, he was planning on killing her and stealing her car. Once he got in and saw how kind she was and with her buying him dinner and all of that, he just couldn't bring himself to go through with it. He finished off this terrifying conversation by saying, quote, please, please. Nikki, please, never ever pick up another hitchhiker. He then hung up and she was never able to get into contact with this man ever again since he called her from a payphone. Safe to say, she probably heeded that advice. Finally, coming in at number one, this scares me a lot, somebody found a dozen live sharks in a basement. Um. Officers from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation searched a home in LaGrangeville. The authorities found a homemade pool in the basement filled with seven live sand sharks and a dead hammerhead shark and other smaller sharks. The sharks were caught and taken to the Long Island Aquarium. Seriously though, who keeps sharks in their basement? No! Starting us off with number 10 is the eye. Now this one was shared by redditor JLKanga23 who said this happened when she was 12 years old. One of her mum's friends from church asked if she and some others would come over and pray all over his house. Apparently as soon as he moved in, things just changed. His wife's personality changed completely, he had started seeing shadows himself and his daughter had just started acting very bizarre as well. Now their house had a storm basement that he'd never gone into because he always got an evil feeling from it. The group got to his house and the user's mum had brought her along because she was too young to be left at home. Now they opened the basement to find a bunch of ritualistic or voodoo like symbols that had been graffitied onto the walls. Already that would have been a red flag for me, I would have been like nah B, miss me with that sh now there was one eye symbol that the user could never get out of her mind even till this day. And that wasn't even the worst part. Scattered all around the floor were dozens and dozens of dried out dead animals. I'm talking cats, rabbits, chickens, dogs, you name it, they were there. There's no way they had gotten down there themselves since there weren't any chickens in the town anyway. So someone purposely brought them there for whatever purpose. And clearly some ritualistic sh** had been going on down there. So no wonder all that bad juju infected his entire family. I get it. Next up at number five, the tombstone. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I found a tombstone in my basement, I'd probably move out that same day and put my house up for sale. That's just some bad juju. Bad vibes. Not here for it. So the story here is Derek Kruk was exploring his basement and stumbled upon something he hadn't noticed before on the floor. After cleaning the area and wiping the floor of the dust and whatever else was on the floor, Derek realized he had discovered a tombstone in his basement. Was the house he was living in built on top of someone's body? Could it be haunted? So many questions, and I have all the answers. No. Derek called up some friends to tell them about his discovery, and upon doing some digging, no pun intended, they soon learned the tomb belonged to Jabez Hardin, who fought in the War of 1812. However, after help from local resident Chip Mangio, who did some of his own research, it was determined that this war veteran actually wasn't buried beneath the home. Chip, who is the head of a local charitable organization that helps assist local charities, inspected every tomb at a local cemetery until he came across Hardin's. Chip went on to explain Hardin's old stone was most likely given away after his new stone was created. He went on to say, gravestones travel. You'll actually find gravestones as part of water spouts or walkways because they're still good stones and they're expensive. So at the end of the day, Derek can rest easy knowing his house wasn't built on a grave, but still knowing your house was made partly with tombstone, even if the house isn't haunted, the basement has got to be redone. Bad stuff's happening down there, I can promise you that right now. In our sixth spot, we have these skinned animals. So a couple of years ago, two forest rangers were on their way to a far location when it got dark out. As a result, they had to camp overnight. But during the night, they were woken up by the sound of footsteps right outside of their tent. All of a sudden, they heard a number of people yell, get out. The two rangers packed up as fast as they could and got the hell out of there. The next morning, the cops went to check out the area and found four skinned animals nailed to the trees surrounding their campsite. Okay, that is horrifying, and I have a number of questions. Number one, who the heck were these people? Number two, what were they doing there? Number three, what the heck? And number four, what the heck? Seriously, that is so messed up. Were they doing some satanic ritual and the forest rangers ruined it, or what? We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Wendigo. Imagine going out camping with some friends and encountering a Wendigo during your trip. Wouldn't that be insane and terrifying, like if you agree. Well, this happened to a forest ranger and a bunch of his friends. So the group went out camping and all was going well, until the second night. During the night, all four of the men woke up to a loud, high-pitched scream. They assumed it was just the coyote. But the next morning, they were in for a surprise. By their campsite, they found a bunch of animal guts everywhere. 
The ranger described it as if there was a bomb in an animal and then it went off. There was just fur, blood, and flesh everywhere. That night is when they came across the monster that devoured the animal. They were out investigating a sound when they saw a weird tall figure move in the distance. It was about six feet tall and did not look like an animal and did not look like a human. When the creature spotted the men, it took off in a flash. They believe that they encountered a Wendigo. Wendigo. <laughs> Coming in at number four, we have the man in the woods. This next individual was a park ranger on a small island. The island could only be accessed by a private boat. During the summer, there would be hordes of people there. But during the off season, the ranger would be the only one on the island. One night, the ranger decided to take a hike around the entire island. Yeah, at night, when it's dark. He thought it would be a fun challenge for himself. Plus, there was no cell or internet service, so you know, what else could you really do? While he was out on his hike, he heard a noise coming from behind him. He turned around and standing behind him was a crazy old man. He was a super pale and super tall man with dark hair. The man gave out a creepy smile and then cackled. The ranger ran for his life and this crazy man ran after him until the ranger made it back safely to his cabin. In the morning, he went back on the trail he had been on and there were no sets of other footprints, only his own, as if the man had never been there at all. Moving on to number three, we have the polar bears. So this next individual was a park ranger in the northern part of Ontario, Canada. In the middle of the night, she woke up to hear something outside of her tent. She opened her eyes and saw the head of a polar bear peeking into her tent. Imagine waking up and seeing that thing breathing in your face. Like, what would you do? Well, the correct answer is don't panic and don't frighten the bear. Thankfully, that's what the ranger did. She stayed calm and eventually the bear left the tent. That could have ended much worse for this woman. She got lucky. Like, I think I would have peed myself, seriously. In our second spot, we have the river accident. A man named Kevin Uxbridge used to be a ranger at Yosemite. One day, he was making his way through the gate, which was along a river, when he heard a huge commotion. People were yelling and screaming and crying. Well, turns out there was a husband and wife standing by the river. The husband was taking a picture of his wife and kept telling her to back up, back up, you know, so he could get a good shot. Well, she ended up backing up too far and she fell into the river. The river was pretty violent that day, so within seconds she was swept under. It took the ranger and firefighters two months before they could find her body. The worst part, her body was found in the swimming hole when the river had settled. People were swimming in there just days before they found her. And in our number one spot, we have the ghostly body. This next story comes from a trail ranger. One time, he noticed that there was a bunch of illegally placed wildlife cameras around, so he went around taking them down. Things were going well until he started hearing a bunch of weird voices. He hopped back on his ATV, but the battery was disconnected, so he couldn't drive off. He was then stuck there waiting for someone to pick him up. They were an hour away and it was getting dark. He decided to sit down and make a small fire. Before he knew it, the voices were back, this time getting louder and louder. Finally, he could hear what was being said. It was two hunters arguing over a kill. That's when all of a sudden he heard a loud bang. It was a gunshot. After that, he smothered the fire and hid until his coworkers arrived. The next day, the two came back with the police to investigate the area. After about an hour of looking, they came across a shallow grave. In it, they found a dead man who had been shot in the face. The freakiest part? It was just the skeleton of the man. He had been there for years. So it seems like he heard ghosts reenacting the murder that happened years ago or something like that. I don't know, it is so freaky. And finally number one, the confinement room. Now this one really hit close to home because I had never heard of the story yet. It happened when I was 17 years old and in Pickering, which is about an hour away from where I grew up. So back in November of 2011, contractors working on an old abandoned home made a scary discovery in the basement. What was described as a confinement styled room with a thick door and several locks was enough to start a police investigation. Reports claimed the house hadn't been lived in since 2006, but this room looked as if it had been constructed within the last year or two. Detective Darren Short explained, I can't get into what was in the room, but the way it was constructed, the time and effort put into it, and the materials used clearly indicated it was a room designed to hold somebody in. There was a locking mechanism nobody would be able to penetrate or breach. The previous homeowners had nothing to do with the newly constructed room, and police never did solve the curious case. So what were they trying to hide in there? What was someone trying to keep in there, really, is the more important question. Creepy. Scary basement I don't want to travel to because that's a scary basement. Starting off this countdown, we have the deer head. 
post on Reddit by RipeOTCDXVI, they claim to be a forest ranger at Yellowstone National Park. One day they were out exploring a part of the park called Lamar Valley, which is about 11 miles from the nearest road. While on the trail, they stumbled upon something very shocking, a perfectly severed deer head. There was no blood whatsoever, and it was cut off with precision. Now obviously, since this is a park, Rangers come across dead animals all the time, but never in such perfect condition. Also, the head was completely uneaten. So now the question is, who did this? Why did they do this? How did they do this? Moving on to number nine, we have the abandoned tent. Reddit user Not So Single Buck was at work one day when he came across a campsite that was set outside of the designated campsite area, which is against the rules of the park, so he went to investigate. In the tent, he found a sleeping bag, some dirty clothes, lots of canned food, and a teddy bear. The whole tent smelled of cigarette smoke. There was nothing that he could do though until the individual returned. He didn't want to wait all day so he just took the open food to prevent animals from being attracted to it and left a note explaining where he had taken the food and why. Two weeks later he returned to the tent and it had remained untouched. As a result, him and his team cleared out the tent. Whatever happened to the person staying in the tent remains a huge mystery. Did a wild animal get to them? Did they fall off a cliff? A body was never found, so we may never know. Coming in at number eight, we have the wolf pack. This story happened three years ago by an old timey forest ranger that worked in Montana. He was out roaming around on his ATV when he saw an older lady in the distance. She was screaming as six wolves closed in around her. The ranger drove down to her as fast as he could, yelling and honking, trying to scare away the wolves. But when he got there, she was nowhere to be found. The only sign of her was a single ring with a black stone which was on the ground where the woman was standing. Seems like the wolves got to her and carried her away. Coming in at number 7, we have the strange blue lights. This person used to work as a ranger at Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. There's a place on this ranch that is said to be haunted. There's a number of urban legends surrounding this place like, oh it's the portal to the underworld, or it's home to an ancient cursed burial ground, you get it. There's also this very eerie legend saying that on some nights, blue lights can be seen. One story claims that a hiker saw an eerie figure on the trail. The figure was tall and emitting a blue light. Well, legend goes that the blue lights are coming from a shaman that guards the ground. Anyways, obviously these are just legends, right? Well, one night the ranger was out with a scout troop when they saw a bunch of weird lights coming from a trail. These were the infamous blue lights talked about in multiple legends. Everyone was so freaked out that they got out of there as fast as they could. Now, let's just say that they're all believers. Starting off this countdown, we have the missing hunter. In December of 2020, a 45 year old hunter was deemed missing after not returning from an afternoon hunt. Two rangers were sent out into the forest to go look for this man. All throughout the night on December 4th, the rangers looked for him. They found tracks and some personal items left by this hunter, but the hunter himself was nowhere to be found. Early in the morning, they were joined by four more rangers to help search through the thick and swampy forest. Just after 3.03 p.m., the hunter was found. Sadly, not alive. He was found in Shaker Mountain Wild Forest. The cause of death is still unknown. Everyone was hoping that this wasn't going to be the outcome. Sadly, what they feared the most came true. In our ninth spot today, we have the aliens. This forest ranger almost got beamed up by a damn UFO spacecraft. Sounds crazy, right? Let me explain. So it was the middle of the night and the ranger was in his cabin chilling when all of a sudden he heard this weird electronic sound coming from outside. He described it as a mixture of TV static and a high pitched ringing sound. He followed the sound to the middle of the woods and all of a sudden he was surrounded by this bright blue light. He says it was so blinding that he could barely see. He looked up and swear he saw a big silver craft hovering above him. He was so scared he ran back to his cabin and locked himself inside. The light stayed in the spot in the woods for a couple of minutes before disappearing. So like, what is that? That for sure had to be aliens, right? Coming in at number eight, we have the creepy stranger. And if you guys are liking this video so far and want to see more spooky content, then smash that like button. One forest ranger told the time he was leading a trip to the top of Mount Sterling in North Carolina. He was with eight middle school kids and one co-instructor. Once they reached the top of the mountain, they settled down for the night. He decided to spend the night in a hammock since it was 
was so nice out. That night though, around 10.30 p.m., he saw something approach the campsite. As it got closer, he saw that it was a person. Now, they were in the middle of nowhere, so it was weird for people to be up there. Apparently, this person just stood there watching the camp for 30 minutes. And then he sat down under a tree facing the camp, just staring. The man stayed there until 3.30 a.m. That's when he got up, surveyed the camp one last time, and then left. Okay, what the heck? Like, what was this dude doing? Was he waiting for the ranger to fall asleep so that he could attack? Was it even a human? Or was it a humanoid creature disguising themselves as a human, okay? These are the questions that we need answers to, people. In our seventh spot, we have the humanoid creature. Speaking of humanoid creatures, the forest ranger in this next story might have really encountered one. This happened a number of years ago in Fishkill, New York. According to the ranger, the area that they were in was quite isolated in the woods. You have a bunch of cabins on top of a mountain, but each cabin is like half a mile apart from each other. One night at 1 a.m., he was cutting through the woods to get to his girlfriend's cabin when he heard a weird rustling coming from the woods. He was expecting it to be a bear or other creature, but what he saw was far more frightening. A three-foot-tall humanoid creature jumped out of the bushes and just stared at him. It was standing on its two feet and it had two arms, but it definitely did not look like a person. He tried to get closer to get a better look at it, but that's when it took off. He said that the way that it ran was very odd. It was very mechanical moving and ran super fast. To this day, he still doesn't know what it is that he saw. So I'm gonna go with a lost house elf because uh, his description just reminds me of Dobby from Harry Potter. In our sixth spot, we have the missing friends. This forest ranger shared the time he was sent out to look for a group of missing teens. They were out camping, but they never returned home. So this forest ranger and another went out in the general direction direction the teens were camping in. They were about 35 kilometers deep into the woods when they started noticing some odd things. Like sticks carved like spears sticking out of the ground, creepy things carved into trees, and stuffed animals hanging by nooses up in the trees. Everything was freshly carved, meaning someone had just been there and done that. So that means they were lurking around there somewhere close. They kept on hiking until it was dark and settled down until the next day. The next morning, they noticed a bunch of ripped clothing and shoe prints. They thought, okay, maybe the group of teens were nearby. But just then, they got a call on their radio saying that the teens had been found. So now, here's what he's wondering. Who did the ripped clothing and footprints belong to? And who created that creepy, weird shrine they encountered the day before? Coming in at number five, we have the Lost Campers. A a couple of years ago, this forest ranger was out practicing winter climbing when he came across a tent in the middle of nowhere. He got closer to it and found it had been ripped open and it was badly faded from the sun. He crawled inside and found the typical camping stuff, sleeping bag, clothes, dried food, etc. But he also found a newspaper in there dated from five years ago. This tent had been up there for five years. Who knows what happened to whoever was staying in there? Isn't that creepy? Moving on at number four, we have the witch. According to this user, his grandfather used to be the equivalent to a mountain ranger down in Mexico. Well, one night he was out patrolling when he heard the sounds of a baby crying. He looked around but couldn't see anything, so he followed the sound of the crying. This is when it gets wild, people. He's walking towards the sound when all of a sudden something flies up into the air and then towards the mountains. He is adamant that it was a witch. He panicked and ran the opposite direction and got in his car and got out of there as fast as he could. Smart man. Coming in at number three, we have the cage. Okay, this one is super freaky, but a forest ranger was out patrolling the area when they came across a big cage with a full-sized mattress in it. The cage also had a container for water and some canned food, as if they were keeping a person captive inside. Yeah, not an animal, a human. The worst part, the mattress was heavily stained with what that looked like blood. Dude, what the heck? Who was in that cage and what happened to them and why were they being held captive? I need to know. In our second spot today, we have the search and rescue. This next park ranger was called in to help locate a missing man in his 20s. He had gone hiking and never returned home. Now, when he got the call about this disappearance, it was nighttime, which makes everything a whole lot harder, but also 
creepier. So he hiked a few miles and then set up camp when it became really late. At around 2 a.m., he woke up to go to the bathroom when he saw a moving light at the base of a cliff. It looked like someone was flashing their flashlight at him. So the next morning, he set off in that direction. As soon as they got there, they saw the missing man's body at the end of the cliff. He had fallen 60 feet down. Here's the creepy part. The coroner arrived and said that the man had been dead there for 48 hours. So, who was out there shining that flashlight then? Did somebody dispose of his body off of the cliff that night? Or was it the man's ghost helping the rangers locate his body? Either way, I got the chills. And in our number one spot today, we have the thumb. This story, by far, is the scariest one on this list, but it's also the shortest one. Posted on Reddit by user Homeless Homie, he said, and I quote, I saw a human thumb nailed to a tree. That one sentence is chilling. For starters, whose thumb does that belong to? Where is that person? What happened? And then who nailed his thumb to the tree? Okay, that is so unnerving and unsettling. And uh, that's all the details he left us with. So we don't know if they ever solved this creepy mystery. And at number 10, with ghost children in the basement. A lot of people claim that their basements are haunted by evil spirits or ghosts that have unfinished business. Either way, it is extremely scary when you hear footsteps screaming or loud abrupt noises from the basement without any reasonable explanations. This is why when this happens, people install cameras with motion detection so they're able to get a notification when those mysterious and scary things happen in their basement. I stumbled across a really scary video of ghost children playing in someone's basement Take a look for yourself. If this was me, I would never install a camera in the basement because I just don't want to know what's going on down there. But going back to the video, that was pretty creepy, so let's move on. Pet alligator bites its way into number nine. I've heard of a lot of people like to keep their pets in their homes, and sometimes they're kept in the basement. Why? I don't know. But this family isn't normal. On January of 2016, a repairman discovered a six foot, 200 pound alligator in the basement of a suburban home in Chicago. The alligator was their secret pet who was sometimes taken out of his cage and put it in the backyard. They had this alligator for 26 years without anyone ever knowing. The repairman was obviously stunned when he saw this monster alligator in the basement, so he called the police. They were able to remove the alligator, and the homeowners were charged with unlawful possession of an endangered species. I mean, is this real life right now? If I had an alligator in my basement, okay, actually, let's stop it right there because I would never have an alligator in my basement. But if I did, I would be fearing for my life every single day. I don't got time for that. I don't care that he's in a cage. They have insanely strong jaws that can easily break through like the little fencing. I think I would rather have a dog or a rabbit as a pet and not a man-eating machine. I'm just gonna put that out there. Move on into number seven, and this takes us over to creepy skeletons in the basement. The internet broke when a story about a creepy looking skeletons were found in a basement under an orphanage in London. These scary looking creatures looked like dead fairies, werewolves, and aliens that were preserved in glass jars. Imagine seeing this. Their flesh had been rotting away and some of their wings were nailed to a display board. To make things even scarier, there was also sketches of a Jack the Ripper victims next to the real human heads and other organs that were well preserved. These nightmare objects were discovered by a bunch of construction workers who were doing some repairs on the home. They found several thousand small wooden boxes that were tightly sealed. So imagine how shocked they were when they first opened up the box. These extremely creepy corpses belonged to Thomas Theodore Maryland who was known as a prominent biologist in the 1800s. If I was working that day, I would run out of the house so damn fast, I would probably be Usain Bolt in a race. And I would definitely ask to like never work in basements ever again. It would be in my contract. So uh, it looks like here you don't want to work in any basements. Why? Yeah, you don't want to know. In at number one, we have a shadow person. A security guard was petrified when he heard a loud banging noises coming from the basement of a deserted football stadium. He decided to go down the dark staircase in order to investigate the suspicious noises, and he recorded the whole thing. When he panned his camera around, he saw a dark, shadowy figure quickly passing along some benches and then disappearing through the wall. 
And yeah, we have the footage for you guys. Take a look at this. <laughs> I mean, come on, is this real life right now? The security guard didn't see this ghostly figure until after he reviewed the tapes. He said that the basement changing room door was being violently opened and closed by an unknown force inside of the room. The man was so terrified and stressed, so on the next day, he handed in his letter of resignation and found a different security job. You know what, smart, smart man. I would do the same thing if I were you, because hell no, I'm not doing that job. Coming into number 10, we have Samar as well. How have you guys seen the movie The Ring? If so, wouldn't you run and hide as far as you possibly could away from this basement? I mean, ah! In 2015, Reddit user Colintendo shared a link to his imger saying, I have the ring in my basement. And on closer inspection, yeah, yeah he does. That's the ring's well right there in the basement. I mean, I would say Colin, get out of there bro, or she probably will come and kill you in seven days. <laughs> Coming into number 9, we have a whole kitchen. How well off do you have to be to discover an entire servant's kitchen in your house that you'd never even noticed until now? I mean seriously. This is quite the discovery. This is exactly what happened to Archie and Philippa Graham Palmer as they explored their property in Wales. Graham Palmer, I mean they sound rich don't they? Archie said that the basement had been a dumping ground for years and it is thought that the room lay unused for a hundred years. Imagine having that much living space. Oh my my goodness. The kitchen was found behind some old junk and was left virtually untouched with pots and pans still on the walls and cookbooks on the shelves. From a kitchen in a basement to the basement of a restaurant with a sick sense of humour, at number 8 we have a creepy gathering of dolls. Redditor Gravity Boy posted, found this in the basement of a restaurant I went to last night. Now the restaurant in question turns out to be Hanny's in Phoenix, Arizona. One fellow redditor looked at the picture and said, it looks like Annabelle's reunion, which to to be honest, it totally does. It turns out that this is an art installation, but I really wouldn't want to be the one that interrupts this illicit miniature game of craps. I also hear that the restaurant has very interesting toilets in this location, but the dolls, the dolls really freak me out. Coming into number 7, we have a 150 year old signed photo of Abraham Lincoln. Can you imagine cleaning out your grandmother's basement to discover signed photographs of one of America's most famous presidents? On top of that, it was in an album with photos of other senators and cabinet members and there were signatures. This is a piece of American history right here. So this is exactly what happened to a woman who appeared on British TV show The Antiques Roadshow. Presenter Wes Cowan valued the album at, wait for it, $100,000 which is a pretty big basement find. Coming into number 6 we have a priceless art piece. A dusty old painting was found in a basement of a deceased elderly couple in New Jersey in 2016. This small painting was just 9 inches tall and was discovered discarded as worthless, but it actually turned out to be a painting by celebrated Dutch artist Rembrandt. The painting, called The Unconscious Patient, was spotted by two eagle-eyed art dealers and sold for $870,000 at auction, which actually is very very cheap for a Rembrandt which have traditionally been going for millions. Imagine $870,000 in your basement. Whew. The painting dates back to the mid 1600s and has since been put on display at the Getty Museum. Coming into number 5 we have a 90 kilo alligator. In 2016, an alligator was discovered living in a basement by a repairman who was working in a man's house in Lansing, Illinois. The gator had apparently been living down there for 26 years when he was discovered. I mean, imagine keeping an alligator in your basement for 26 years. The reptile belongs to Charles Price, who said that he walked it in his garden and fed it chicken breast. The gator had grown to six feet long when he was discovered by the worker. He was later seen and taken to an animal shelter, but like, imagine being the repair guy going down to someone's house and finding a gator in their basement. Seriously. Anyone for severed puppet heads at number 4. Hurrah! So this is another reddit classic. A redditor posted that they found this horrifying array in their basement behind the furnace. Some of you may say how did they not know that this was behind the heater, but some people on this list had no idea they were housing a full kitchen, so… So here we have an array of disembodied puppet heads tied together with strings. Hip hip hooray for the person who constructed this to scare the living bejesus out of future residents. Oh great, at number 3 we have a mass grave. When new owners of a home formerly resided in by Benjamin Franklin 
moved in, they found the grim discovery of 1,200 bone fragments in the soil below their basement. The house on Craven Street in London had fragments of bone dating back to the exact time when Benjamin Franklin lived there in the 1700s. It turns out that one of the founding forefathers of America wasn't a murderer, he just let this house be used as a secret anatomy school at the time. Back then, dissecting bodies was illegal, so it was all in the name of science, which I can respect. Alright, coming in at number 10 now, we have Joshua Rules. In 2015, a man took his brother along with him to go house hunting in Michigan when they stumbled across a dirty, wet, and unfinished basement. They saw writing on the wall, and when they took a closer look, they realized that a child used to live down there. One wall read Josh's Rules. Number one, stop reading your walls. Number two, no watching Isaiah through the hole. And number three, no writing or drawing on the walls. Number four, if you don't like these rules, go to number zero. Other messages said things like, don't climb into my room, or, and I think this one is the creepiest, stop watching me. The man posted all of these pictures to Reddit, where users came up with their theories, ranging from schizophrenia to the supernatural. Very strange stuff either way. Next up at number nine now, we have Satan. In 2015, Imja user Bushi992 posted these pictures to Imja of the basement and attic in the house that he and his friends had just moved into. As you can see, something went down here. The symbols appear to be satanic in nature. There were pentagrams, rams, snakes, and strange messages on the wall, such as, for I am the earth, and within me the devil burns. Many people asked them why didn't they ask to see the attic and basement before they moved in. I think that's a very good point. I'm not sure if I could sleep knowing this stuff was below me. At number 8 now, we have the tape. Reddit user Lumberjack shared pictures of a small basement passageway that he discovered in his new home. Inside it, he found a locked door, which concealed an entrance to a small room. Inside that room was a briefcase and a safe. He opened that and found some money, a few watches, and videotapes. The tapes had writing on the front of them. One of them simply read, No, 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 no. He handed everything over to the police for investigation. Would you guys have done the same, or would you have ignored the message and watched the tape? I'm not sure if I could have. Okay, next up at number seven now, we have the tombstone. In 2016, a student from Massachusetts made a grim discovery in their university house basement, a grave. Derek Crook was interviewed about the tombstone next to the boiler in his home. The message on it says, this marks the burial site of Jabez Harden, who served in the War of 1812. Now, he died in 1879, at the age of 83. At first, the housemates were very creeped out by this find, but now James actually quite enjoys shocking visitors to the house by randomly announcing there's a grave in the basement. Maybe that's just his coping mechanism. Next up, at number six, we have graffiti. In 2012, Reddit user Tallest Waldo shared a creepy discovery he found in his basement. This writing, accompanied by some very strange symbols. Another Reddit user identified the symbols as being part of occult spellcasting. They suggested this basement used to be a cult member's ritual workspace. After meditating on the symbols for a while, it seems they had an epiphany and wrote the message that we can now see on the wall. I can kind of make out something about their soul being fire, and the time has come to use the gateway they have opened. What do you guys think it says? I'm not even sure if I want to know. At the number four spot now, we have mold. In 2005, a family who moved into a new home were decorating one of the rooms when they noticed the bookcase was a little bit loose. They nudged it and it swung open to reveal a secret passageway. Inside, they found a note that read, Hello, if you're reading this, then you found the secret room. The letter went on to explain how they were the previous tenant of the house but had to move out because of mold, which made their children very sick. The new owners who were reading this actually listened to the warning and moved out because of the mold too. They even sued the broker who sold them the house. I'm sure they're happy they got the warning, but I would be a little bit creeped out to find a note that congratulated me for finding the secret room. Very weird stuff. All right, next up at number three now, we have the asylum. Now, not much is known about the picture you're about to see or even who took it, but I think that kind of adds to the whole mysterious allure of it. This was the writing found on the basement wall of an abandoned mental asylum. 
column. It reads, I never knew much about people until I took one apart just to see how it worked. Many commenters online have speculated who exactly wrote this and if perhaps the story behind this message could lead to the reason the asylum was abandoned in the first place. And finally at number one now we have the bunker. Now for me a bunker is basically a huge creepy basement with nothing above it. It's like a super basement. In 2014 an Imja user shared a story and pictures from when they visited a friend in northern Germany. In the woods they found an abandoned bunker. They followed the endless hospital like hallways. As they ventured deeper and deeper they found graffiti on the walls with words like die and help. Eventually they came across a huge yellow vault door that had been ripped off its hinges. A worrying sight to see what could have been that powerful. A little further on they found the creepiest writing so far. A message in German that translates to hello Satan I love you. It wasn't long before they just turned back. That clearly isn't a place you want to stick around in for too long. Coming in at number 10 we have a spooky chapel. Um so this is terrifying. In Telford UK Pat and Diane Fowler wondered what was inside a square box seal next to a wall at the bottom level of their house. They opened it up and then they found a metal grill in their floor. Eventually they went below the grill and found a totally eerie stone chamber that looked like an old chapel. It even had had a crucifix on the floor. They then found that there was a staircase leading into a cupboard in another area of the house. Weird. Coming in at number 9 we have mythical creatures. According to YouTube channel Incredible News E3, some strange creatures were found in a basement of a mansion in the UK. Allegedly in the 60s in London, an old mansion belonging to a Thomas Theodore Merrilyn was being prepared for demolition. As people were searching and doing a final check, wooden boxes were found in the basement. Now inside these wooden boxes were what looked like alien and fairy carcasses. They now reside in the Maryland Museum. Now the museum does exist but I'm calling fake news all over the findings. I'm sure that they were weird things in the boxes but they to me look a bit like models. Coming in at number 4 of the top 10 insane things found in a basement we have a stranger. Um like hello there and who are you and why are you in my basement? This is very much a question that these Ohio State University kids had on their lips when they discovered a secret door in their basement that then led to a secret bedroom in which a mystery man called Jeremy was living in. Jeremy what are you doing there? The group of lads thought that there was a ghost in the house that opened the oven and the cupboard doors but it turns out it was Jeremy. This sounds way too good to be true. One museum found that they were sitting on a hidden wine vault and that is coming into number 3. Researchers at New Jersey's Keene University discovered a hidden wine vault in the basement of the Liberty Hall History Museum. There were 50 bottles of wine and other spirits that date back 300 years just like sitting there. The loot included a 1796 case of Madeira. Now this wine is known for its longevity so it probably still tastes good. There was also a whole bunch of Cuban cigars. What a finding. Coming in at number 2 we have NASA secrets. Oh my. In 2015 a dealer was cleaning out a Pittsburgh basement of a deceased IBM engineer who worked for NASA during the space race era. So this was from the late 50s to the mid 70s. They found a whole load of NASA files on two giant computers. 93 of the tapes that they found had data about Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. Now these were flyby missions to Jupiter and Saturn. How cool who is that? Off at number 10 is a man on fire. Just because of the nature of the job, there are a lot of gruesome things that operators can find themselves in the middle of. Now, more often than not, they are talking with the victim of the attack, but in the case of Reddit user Celtic055, the person on the line was the one doing the harm. Quote, I took a call from a guy who lit himself on fire. A sheriff deputy was serving a vacate order when the guy getting served decided to wrap himself in a blanket, dump kerosene on himself, then light himself on fire. Worst part is that he was still alive when the fire was put out. He was still breathing for another few hours before passing on. Luckily I did not see the guy, I only heard the screams when talking to the deputy. I can't imagine how that operator must have felt. Moving on to number 9, the address. 
One of the most important parts of a dispatch call is to get the address as quickly as you can so that you can send out whoever needs to be on site as quickly as possible. This next story from a former Reddit user starts off by explaining they were in a training class and the teacher who was a dispatcher played a real life example of one of their phone calls that proves just how important that rule really is. Quote, it was an old woman on the phone that was calling to report someone creeping around in the backyard. She asked them to hurry. The dispatcher says police are on their way but won't be there for five minutes. The dispatcher asks for an address but hears it wrong. As the lady is saying the address, she gets attacked and lets out this scream that sounds like a dying animal combined with the worst fear you've ever heard in your life. Then it's silent. Gone. The phone's on, you can hear someone moving stuff around. Police spent four hours looking for that woman's house. The dispatcher got the address wrong. Moving on to number eight, a house fire. Our next scary story comes from Reddit friend James Hetfield, and let me just say that I truly hope this person got access to some good counseling after this one. Quote, the worst was when a lady escaped her burning house and called 911 to report it, and that her husband and daughter were still inside. The number one rule for us is to get you out and keep you out, but she went back in and died along with her family. It was only a few days before Christmas. That one effed with me for a while. I mean, it's the fact that she was on the phone with someone who is actually safe and then just had to listen as they put themselves back in danger that neither the first responder or the operator could help them get out of. Definitely a disturbing day for anyone involved. Coming in at number seven, callback. This next story comes from Redditor hashtag libertarian and they start off by explaining that while they have unfortunately received many disturbing calls over the years, this one is by far the worst. Quote, the one I had, this lady was screaming. Just horrific screaming. Then the phone went dead. Now I can only imagine the fear that would invoke for this operator, since the only way you can help these people is if you can talk to them. Now our Reddit friend was able to get a hold of her, but sadly it did not have the happy ending they were hoping for. Quote, I called back only to hear that horrific screaming again. Then I heard someone in the background screaming, he's stabbing her, he's stabbing her. She died. He did get caught by an officer I had dispatched. She literally jumped off a car roof and landed on top of the guy. Not sure what his sentence was. Seriously, this job is not for the weak. Moving on to number six, speedboat. Next up we have a story from Redditor Lurler and this might just be the disturbing reminder we all need to never ever 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 manage heavy machinery that you are not confident working ever again. Otherwise you might wind up making the biggest mistake of your life. Quote, I answered a call from a woman who had run over her husband in a speedboat and chopped off his legs. The operator continued to explain that the rest of their young family was accompanying them in the boat, so they would have witnessed the tragedy. But worst of all, quote, it was the husband's 40th birthday and he wanted to go water skiing. The wife didn't want to because she wasn't comfortable driving the boat. Unfortunately, the husband died from the accident. Coming in at number five, paralyzed. Next up, we have a story from user AHGWG, and I actually can't fathom having to be on the other end of this call. Quote, the one that sticks with me the most was a man who was paralyzed from the waist down and had phoned up to tell us that he was midway through attempting to amputate his own legs at the thigh using nothing but a hacksaw and a Stanley knife. He'd laid newspaper down on the floor and everything in an attempt not to get blood on the carpet. Naturally, not long into the call, he passed out due to blood loss grim stuff. Now I looked into this a bit more because the idea of trying to amputate a paralyzed limb seemed a little strange to me, but apparently it is not entirely uncommon to have intense nerve pain in paralyzed parts of the body. So while it's not explicitly said by anyone in the story, the pain could have been the reason behind his wanting to chop off his own leg. And that coupled with the fact that he knew he wouldn't feel the amputation itself justified the DIY idea. I just hope this guy got to the hospital and survived. 
Moving on to number four, adultery. This next one comes from Redditor Unit 91, and to be honest, it is super tragic. Like, if this happened to me, I would probably need to find a new job, but still be scarred forever, kind of tragic. So I hope this poor operator got the support they needed after this call. The Redditor starts off by explaining that they worked in a very busy city that was sadly no stranger to violence, SA, and domestic disputes, and that they were used to it and had even heard heard people die over the phone before, but this one was different. This time a lady calls and says to the operator that her husband has a weapon to her head and that he is not going to leave her alone and that they have to send help quick. Our reddit friend that explains she's screaming into the phone, then she puts it down. Quote, all I can hear at this point is her yelling at her husband, but I love you baby, then boom. But I love you baby, boom. Something garbled, but I love you, boom. So at this point I'm standing up yelling into my little microphone, stop saying I love you. And everyone in the room with me now turns and looks at me like I have five heads. But I was caught up in the call. Turns out the man walked in on the woman and found another guy in the closet. Said guy ran out of the house, but the woman didn't make it out alive. Moving on to number three, under the influence. So before I get into this one, I have to warn you, it is a lot. So while I am going to try to be delicate, if you have a queasy stomach, just be warned. This next story was posted to Reddit a few years ago by the user you says underscore lightning, and while it doesn't include a planned killing or anything like that, it might still be one of the more shocking things I have come across. Quote, I was a 911 dispatcher in Portland, Oregon, and received a call from a strung out girl. Story was she said her boyfriend had been doing a lot of hard for three days and owned a lab. Now here's where it gets gross. Quote, when she called, she was screaming that her boyfriend had wiggly purple worms in his arm and there was blood everywhere. Turned out that they were his veins. He was literally so out of his gourd on drugs that he began tearing at his flesh and ripping out his veins. I mean, I can't. According to our Reddit friend, they switched professions pretty quickly after that. I would have done the same. Coming in at number two, a horrible accident. I'm sure that dispatchers receive a lot of calls from people that are suffering from freak accidents. However, I can only imagine the fear that swept across this caller when they received this phone call. Warning, this one is also a bit gruesome. So this story comes from Reddit user Victimo911, and I actually can't wrap my brain around how helpless this dispatcher must have felt at this moment. They begin by saying that they received a call from a man with a very difficult to understand speech and so at first they thought it might be a heart attack or a stroke or something, but sadly it was much, much worse. Finally they were able to get his address clearly to send help and when they finally could get out of him what the problem was, he said, quote, cut, leg, off chainsaw. From there it was just guttural moans and groans until the phone suddenly went silent. As it turns out, he had fallen from a tree with his chainsaw and accidentally cut off his own leg. He then tied his belt around the stump, crawled to his phone on the porch and called. But sadly, he died with the phone in his hand before help could arrive. I mean, I hope they gave this poor dispatcher some counseling after that one. And last up in our number one spot, we have a mysterious caller. So this last one from Redditor Smokey Bonaparte is maybe not as gruesome as the others on this list, but it is certainly a disturbing call to say the least. Quote, received a call from an elderly lady who had trouble breathing. I had taken several calls from her and her husband in the past, so I recognized her voice. I dispatched an ambulance to her residence and held her on the line trying to keep her calm while the ambulance was responding. I'm talking to her, asking her about her husband and how he was doing and just making small talk with her. The ambulance calls in and advises they are on scene and I let them know that she is in severe respiratory distress and I still had her on the line. I let her know the ambulance is coming to the door to go answer the door and she says okay and hangs up the phone. So far, pretty normal, right? Well, here's where it gets weird. 
The EMT and paramedic on scene call back about a minute later and advise no one is answering the door. We have a sheriff unit who was in the area pulling up on the scene about that time. The sheriff unit confirmed the address and advised he is breaching the door to make access to the PT. Five minutes go by and the paramedic on scene radios in asking who the caller was. I advise it was the elderly female who lived at the residence. He tells me that he's going to call in and needs to speak with the supervisor on shift. We get him over to the supervisor and the supervisor confirms the information that I gave him and asks what's going on. Apparently, the elderly female had been dead for a while and was already in full rigor mortis. They thought I was wrong on the caller, but the other dispatchers played it back and confirmed that it was the female who called. The ambulance transferred to the hospital and we got the same calls and disbelief from the doctors. So I took a call from a ghost. Now, if that isn't bone chilling, I don't know what is. Number 10, EMF Trail. This person was ghost hunting at the Vasilla Axe House, which is known for its gruesome history and apparent paranormal activity. They were with a group, but by 5 a.m. they decided to take turns doing solo investigations. So they set up a trail of EMF readers, which are used to track changes in electromagnetic fields caused by ghosts, and they had eight in total, leading from the kids' room to the parents' bed where they were located. The EMF EMF readers had been quiet all night, but then he saw the first one in the kids' room light up. As time went on, he saw them slowly lighting up one by one, getting closer and closer to where he was seated. He started to get extremely anxious and was having trouble breathing, feeling an intense sense of dread. Finally, the one right next to him lit up and he suddenly felt the feeling of someone pulling on his shoe. He immediately panicked and sprinted from the home, describing his exit like a fat little pig running from a lion. Number nine. Stanley Hotel. The Stanley Hotel is another infamous location known for being apparently haunted by many different spirits, a hot spot for paranormal investigators. This person was on a ghost tour at the Stanley Hotel in September of 2018, where they take you around the hotel and allow you to take pictures, in hopes of finding evidence of the paranormal. They got to the ballroom and took multiple photos, as if you take multiple photos you'll be able to tell if things are different between the pictures. The first photo seems to show a completely empty ballroom with nothing out of the ordinary. But the second photo, taken mere seconds later, shows in the bottom right what appears to be a ghostly figure sitting down in one of the seats. They also shared their photo album to show proof that the photo was taken at the Stanley Hotel at that time, and it had not been edited or altered. Number 8. Voice This investigator was at an abandoned hospital with two other people. At the time, they were doing an EVP, where you set up a voice recording and ask questions about every 30 seconds, hoping for a ghost to respond on the recording. They were in the basement when suddenly a voice seemed to talk in his head, seeming to put their own thoughts into his brain. One of the other investigators was a woman, and in his head he got the distinct thought of, I want her to come into my office, seemingly the ghost of someone who worked in the hospital and wanted the female investigator to come into his office. With this thought in the head, the investigator asked, do you want her to come into your office? When the investigation was finished, they listened back to the recordings, and after he asked that question, there was a distinct voice clearly saying, yes. Number 7. Man in a White Shirt These paranormal investigators had their paranormal encounter before they even got to their location, instead experiencing it in the car on the way. They were driving in a group and it was the beginning of autumn, the person in the back seat taking pictures of the changing leaves on their cell phone. But the trees weren't the only thing that they managed to capture. In each of the photos, for around a two mile distance, there appeared to be the figure of a man wearing a white shirt. No one in the car was wearing white, and it was a distinctly human figure, so they knew it wasn't just the reflection of one of them or something else in the car. Eventually, the photos started appearing normal, no ghost to be seen, meaning whatever was in the car or following alongside them had decided to leave. They noted that it only appeared while they were listening to Madonna on the radio, and it disappeared when it was over, so I guess the ghost was just a big Madonna fan. Number 6. Girlfriend Possessed This story comes from the same paranormal investigator who had the ghost thoughts in his head. He cited this interaction as the scariest thing he had ever witnessed. He had an ex-girlfriend who claimed to be sensitive to spirits and the paranormal world. They were not out on a ghostly investigation, but instead just hanging out in their apartment, when suddenly his ex-girlfriend seemed to go into a trance and become possessed. 
She was completely still and stopped responding to him no matter how hard he tried to get her to come back to reality. When she finally did snap out of it, he heard the sound of flapping wings, like a bird was in the room. But he was of course in his bedroom in his apartment and there were no birds around. He says he unfortunately didn't have a camera or sound recorder around to capture the event, but swears that he truly experienced it. Number 5. Haunted Mansion Now let's get into an investigation that took place in a haunted mansion. And no, not the one at Disney World. But if you're watching this within the week it comes out, I'm actually there right now and I'll see you when I get back. Anyways, a group was investigating a haunted mansion where there had been lots of reports of auditory evidence, so most of their equipment was sound recording devices. Unfortunately, this left him unprepared for when he saw an aerial disturbance, which he describes as a spherical area of wiggly air about the size of a basketball. It then started to move towards him and as it did, the equipment in his hands started going off, even overheating and starting to smoke. The other people in the group also witnessed this and some of them say that they actually saw a full apparition as well, them describing it as a man in Civil War era clothing. They also captured unexplained noises and random shifts in temperature. Next up at number 5, Robert Hansen. Known in the media as the Butcher Baker, Hansen was an extremely sick killer who quite literally viewed his victims as prey. In his adolescence, Robert was an awkward and shy boy who had absolutely no luck with girls. These early rejections festered into a deep hatred for women, for which he later would seek revenge. As he got older, he began finding solace in archery and hunting, and would routinely spend his time perfecting his craft alone in the woods. Then in the early 1960s, he began seeking revenge, at first by committing arson on his high school property, but then soon turned to seek revenge on women specifically. By 1971, he was kidnapping and taking advantage of women, but not yet killing. He was charged and sentenced to five years for his crimes, but after just six months was released on a work program. After his release is where it really got scary. He began kidnapping women and escorts, taking them back to his apartment where he would do awful things to their bodies, before flying them out to secluded areas in the wilderness and telling them he was going to hunt them down and kill them. Tragically, an estimated 21 women lost their lives to this monster, but thankfully he was convicted and sentenced to 400 and 61 years in prison without possibility of parole. Moving on to number four, Albert Fish. Also known as the Brooklyn Vampire, Albert Fish was a terrifying killer responsible for the death of three people in the mid 1920s, although according to him, it was well over 100. Fish grew up in an unstable home, both his parents suffered from mental illness, and after his father died, he was sent to live at an orphanage. While there, he was by the other orphans, but he started to develop a rather confusing feeling towards the pain. He began to enjoy it. As Fish got older, he started seeking darker and more twisted things to feel alive, and soon that led to the kidnapping, taking advantage of, killing, and later devouring of minors. Thankfully, the monster was caught in 1935, and shockingly, he wasted no time denying his atrocities. In fact, he almost seemed proud of them. I can't, and frankly won't, go into detail about what he did, but it is some of the most disgusting stuff I have ever read about. And I can only imagine the agents on his case felt the same. Eventually, Fish was sentenced to death and died by electric chair in 1936. After his death, his lawyer refused to release his final statement, saying, quote, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. Next up at number three, Michael James Pratt. Currently on the FBI's top 10 most wanted, I can only imagine how disturbed the FBI was when they first became aware of this case. Between approximately 2012 to 2019, Michael Pratt, along with a few accomplices, was involved in recruiting underage girls to be a part of an adult film production company that he owned and operated. Pratt lured the girls in under Craigslist ads asking for models, and from there he promised payment in exchange for a close modeling gig. But sadly, 
This couldn't have been further from what he had planned for the victims. Beyond the obviously morally despicable stuff they were making these girls do, he would also force past victims into providing false assurance to the girls that their films would never end up online. Allegedly, some of the victims were not permitted to leave shoot until the shoot was completed, others were forced to perform after declining participation, and the crew was also known to commit SA when the girls wouldn't comply. After fleeing the country in 2019, right before his trial for his crimes, he was added to the FBI list, and the search for this creep continues. Moving on to number two. Mark Putnam. In the mid-1980s, Mark Putnam was a happy husband, father, and successful FBI agent. But after relocating to the Bureau's Pikeville office, things began to change. At this time, Carl Edwards Lockhart, a notorious bank robber, had just been let out of prison, and Putnam believed that he was back to his old ways. So he began gathering informants that could help him take down Lockhart. One of these informants was Susan Smith addicted divorcee raising a family who needed the cash. But soon, she became more than just Putnam's informant. The two began an affair, and by 1989, Smith was allegedly pregnant. This terrified Putnam. He knew it would not only ruin his marriage, but end his career, and so he demanded a paternity test and explained he and his wife could adopt from her. This, however, led to a violent fight between them that ultimately ended with Putnam strangling Susan to death. Initially, the suspect was Susan's ex-husband, but soon Putnam was interrogated, and after failing a polygraph, he confessed to the whole thing and offered to lead the FBI to where she was. However, there are a few mysteries. Susan Smith's sister claimed that FBI agent Ron Poole, Putnam's superior, not only knew about Smith's alleged pregnancy, but also disclosed to Smith information about Putnam's illicit activities with other informants. And, allegedly, medical examiners claimed that they were unable to find any trace of a fetus during an autopsy on Smith, who should have been four months pregnant. I mean, it's just all disturbing top to bottom. And last up in our number one spot, the Brianna Dennison case. Brianna Dennison was a college student home for the holidays in Reno, Nevada, when tragically one night she went missing while staying over at a friend's house. In the days following, the Reno Police Department conducted an investigation at her friend's home where she had last been seen and concluded she had been abducted after discovering male DNA on a doorknob and her own on a pillowcase. At this point, the FBI became involved in the search and after investigations linked the male DNA to other open cases involving sexually violent crimes, they worried that the missing girl's fate had already been decided. And sadly, nearly a month after she had gone missing, Brianna was found dead in a ditch. That fall, after lengthy investigations, interrogations, and DNA samples, they finally found the man guilty of the crime, James Biella. And it came out that he had actually held her captive in his home for several days, harming and doing awful things to her body before he eventually killed her. And to top it off, he lived one block from FBI agents, two sheriffs, and a local police officer. So he was literally doing it all under their nose. Number four, power. This one comes from a person who has done paranormal investigation for a long time, being a part of three different groups over the years. When asked what his scariest experience and clearest evidence was, he shared this story. He was investigating a large home and was seated in a children's bedroom with two other investigators. They were sat in the almost complete darkness as they called out to the child's spirit. They suddenly then heard a loud popping noise, which he describes as similar to a weapon being fired. He says that there was no light, no heat, or even smell that came along with the noise. It just seemed to come and go out of nowhere. At the same time, all the power in the house completely shut off. They inspected the room afterwards and found nothing that could have caused the loud popping sound. They also have it on recording so they know that they didn't just imagine it. Number three, help me. This investigator was invited to stay overnight at a guild hall 
in London where they reported having things disappear from their bedrooms only to turn up in the basement. The basement apparently being the hub for the majority of activity. They set up sound recorders, cameras, and other equipment in the basement before locking the door and setting up security cameras to ensure that nobody went in or out. The next day when they returned, they found that nothing appeared to have been touched and they started going through all the recordings and tapes. All of them were empty except for one. An hour after everyone left the building, he can hear two voices talking and one that seems to ask, is that the bathroom? He also heard the voice of a weak sounding woman saying, please help me. About 15 minutes later, it says again, oh God, Paul, please help me. The freakiest part of this story being that the name of the paranormal investigator was Paul. Number two, Asylum Ghost. The Anoka State Hospital is located in Minnesota and opened in the year 1900, operating for almost a full century before closing in 1999. It has a long history of patients being treated poorly and anyone who passed away being buried in an unmarked grave. There are also underground tunnels through which patients would apparently try to escape but would often pass away. One person went into the asylum by himself, bringing his camera to try and catch pictures of any ghosts. He apparently heard various different unexplained noises like shuffling and footsteps, so he decided to start taking pictures, and that's when he caught this photo. It appears to show the shape of a person standing in a long robe at the end of the hallway. The hospital has a reputation of being haunted by the ghosts of all its patients, so it's possible that this person may have managed to catch a picture of one of the spirits. Number one, apparition. All right, this one in our number one spot actually comes from my own friend in the United States who does paranormal investigations. When I started writing this video, I reached out to him and asked if he had anything to share and this is what he sent me. He was with his friend exploring an abandoned hospital in Michigan and they discovered that all the buildings were connected with small tunnels. One of the building's entrances was blocked off, so they decided to try and find their way in using the tunnels. While making their way though, they found a long tunnel that appeared to go on for a mile or two, so they decided to just turn back, taking a photo of the tunnel ahead of them before they left. It wasn't until after that he realized he captured what looks like a full body apparition with its hands on its hips. They're planning to go back for a full investigation as they've gone twice and heard things like footsteps, doors, and more. So shout out to Icy for that one and good luck. Starting us off at number 10 is Dan Cooper. Back in 1971, a man who went by the alias Dan Cooper hijacked a commercial plane and no one has ever been able to find him since. According to those involved, shortly after takeoff, he handed a note to a flight attendant claiming to have a his briefcase. He demanded four parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills, which is the equivalent of like $1.2 million nowadays. Otherwise, he was going to kill everyone on the plane. After the flight landed in Seattle, Cooper released the 36 passengers once authorities had provided him with the money and parachutes, but kept both pilots, one flight engineer, and flight attendants as hostages on the plane. From there, he forced them to fly to Mexico City, but somewhere over Nevada, Cooper jumped off the plane with the stolen cash. The FBI launched a massive search that is still considered one of the longest and most exhaustive investigations in FBI history. But Dan Cooper has yet to be found, and I'm sure many agents lost sleep over trying to figure out this case. Moving on to number nine, the West Mesa Bone Collector. Back in 2009, a woman on a leisurely walk with her dog came across something peculiar a human bone. Little did she know, she'd stumbled upon a major crime scene. Upon her discovery, authorities became immediately involved and discovered that it was a mass grave filled with human remains. But how did they get there? A killer dubbed the West Mesa Bone Collector. Active between 2001 to 2005, the killer was known to target young women, usually Hispanic and almost always involved in late night services or the trade, but not exclusively, which made it hard to identify why he chose his victims. While we know practically nothing about the killer, we do know that he would take the bodies to the desert to dispose of them. After years of police investigation, the remains of 11 women were found scattered in the deserts of Albuquerque, but the exact way they died is yet to be discovered as medical examiners and forensic experts have not been able to identify his methods, which 
is very unusual. Sadly, neither police or FBI have ever been able to track down who was responsible for ending these young women's lives, and I am sure the agents on the case are continually disturbed by the fact that he remains on the loose. Moving on to number 8. Glendon Scott Crawford. In 2012, Glendon Scott Crawford, who was a part of the pointy hat white supremacist group, conspired with a guy named Eric Fate to turn an industrial grade x-ray radiation device into a weapon of mass destruction. The plan was to have a remote controlled death ray he could use on Muslims in the United States, targeting mosques, community centers, and so on. So Crawford sought assistance from Chris Barker, one of the imperial wizards in his hate group. However, what Crawford did not know was that Barker, in an effort to handle his own felony charges, had become an informant for the FBI. This led to another FBI agent coming on the case undercover, and eventually, once there was enough evidence, stacked against Crawford's plan to commit acts of he was sentenced to 30 years behind bars. Still, I can only imagine how disturbing it must have been for those undercover agents to be in the same room with such a disgusting man. Moving on to number 7, Richard Trenton Chase. Often referred to as the Vampire of Sacramento, Chase was a truly terrifying killer who took the life of six people in just one month back in 1977. Before he turned to human victims, Chase would capture animals and bring them back to his apartment to kill and disembowel. From there, he would eat them raw, sometimes mixing them with Coca-Cola in his blender. Then in 1973, Chase was forcibly admitted to an institution after being taken to emergency for trying to inject rabbit's blood into his veins. While in the facility, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and became known as the vampire as he all too often killed animals and drank their blood. But by 1976, he was deemed no longer a threat to society and released back into his mother's custody. Tragically, she began weaning him off his medication, believing he didn't really need it, and once again, he slipped into old habits. But this time, it wasn't birds and rabbits Chase was harming. He was breaking into homes and killing people before treating them just as he did his animals. Eventually, he was put on trial for his six victims, and a jury ruled him guilty, rejecting the defense's attempt that he could not be tried due to insanity. Chase was sentenced to death, but ended up taking taking his own life while behind bars before his execution. Coming in at number 6, Daniela Green. Born in Germany, Daniela moved to the US with her family before she was hired as a contract linguist for the FBI in 2011. While working at the FBI, they made use of her bilingual skills and ended up assigning her to a German terror criminal known as Individual A at the time. Through research, Green discovered her subject was a former rap artist named Dennis Kuzbert, who had joined, you know, that group, and over time, Green found ways to correspond with Kuzbert. However, in a shocking turn of events, their relationship turned romantic. Soon Green made secretive plans to fly out to Syria and meet him, and within hours of her arrival, the two got married. But it didn't take long before she realized what a mess she found herself in, and ended up emailing an acquaintance for help. Within five weeks, American authorities caught up to her, Green was arrested and returned to the US, but was released after only nine months in jail, and the FBI spun her in involvement with Kuspert as that of an unsuspecting linguist duped by a conniving criminal. Still, I can only imagine how disturbing it must have been for everyone involved, knowing that one of their own had double-crossed them and married the literal enemy they were trying to take down. The FBI and CIA deal with a lot, but humans are capable of some pretty scary things that can even shake them up. So let's take a look at some of these disturbing cases. The Taman Shud case is one of the most baffling, mysterious unsolved homicides in the world. It involves the death of an unidentified man who was found on a beach in Adelaide, Australia in 1948. He had no identification, no signs of violence, and no apparent cause of death. It was all just a mystery. The only clue to his identity was a piece of paper with the words Taman Shud, meaning ended or finished in Persian, that was found in a hidden pocket of his trousers, not suspicious at all. The paper matched a rare edition of a book of poems called the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, which was later found in a car near the beach. The book had a phone number and a code written on the back cover, but neither led to 
to any conclusive answers. There's been intense speculation ever since regarding the identity of this man, the cause of his death, and the events leading up to it. Public interest in the case remains pretty significant for several reasons. The death occurred at a time of heightened international tensions following the beginning of the Cold War, the apparent involvement of a secret code, the possible use of an undetectable poison, and the inability or unwillingness of authorities to identify the dead man. But regardless, it seems like we'll never know who this mystery man was or why he died. In 2001, Armin Mewis from Germany posted an advert looking for a well-built 18 to 30 year old to be slaughtered and then consumed. Yeah, he was a people eater. Throughout his childhood, Armin fantasized that if he were to eat someone, they would be with him forever, so he would never be lonely again. Anyone who that was these weird thoughts like that, like if I just eat someone, they'll be with me forever. That's not how food works, guys. It gets used as energy, you take dumps. Do you not take dumps? The food leaves. Not only is it an evil thing to do, but it also just scientifically makes no sense, which seems to anger me more than the evil part. Anyway, more disturbingly, many people actually replied to the advert, but all of them got cold feet, obviously, apart from one man who ended up meeting up with Armin. Armin made a video of him dismembering his victim. Armin amputated the victim's nether regions, and they both attempted to eat it, but it was too chewy, no comment. The man then took 20 sleeping pills to end his own life, but this was not a success, and he slowly bled out from the amputation. Armin then ended the man's life by slicing his throat and consumed the remains. Over a period of 10 months, he was sentenced to life imprisonment after stating to a psychiatrist that his fantasies of devouring people had not subsided. Can't imagine the trauma investigators had to go through, like actually watching that video, because just like reading Reading that out loud uh, is disturbing me a little bit, honestly. British Columbia, Canada is home to one of the most gruesome and baffling discoveries within the past few decades. Since 2007, at least 16 severed human feet and running shoes have been found on its shores. Although some of the feet have been identified, it's still unknown why the feet were detached and how they got in the sea. The latest solved case involving a human foot was completed in 2019, four foot discovered in 2018. It's September of that year, left foot was found inside a blue sock and light gray Nike running shoe. That shoe and foot matched information police had in a missing person report from 2018. The family of that missing person was contacted and provided samples for DNA testing, which matched the DNA samples from the foot. Since then, there have been other feet found, as one was found in 2021 and one found in July of 2023. Next, we have the crime solved by a ghost. Yes, a homicide case was solved with the help of a ghost. In 1977, Teresita Tabasa was a respiratory therapist who worked at a hospital in Chicago. She was found stabbed to death and burned in her apartment on February 21st. The police had no suspects or leads until they received a very unusual tip from another hospital employee named Remy Chua. Remy claimed that she had been possessed by the spirit of Basa, who told her that the person responsible for the crime was a man named Alan Showery, who also worked at the hospital. Remy said that Alan had come to Basa's apartment to fix her TV and then robbed her and ended her life. The police were skeptical, but decided to give an investigation ago anyway, they found out that he had some of Basa's jewelry and that he gave it to his girlfriend as a gift. He also matched the description of a man seen leaving her apartment on the day of her death. Alan confessed to the crime and was convicted in 1979. The case remains one of the few examples of paranormal evidence being used in court. I do wonder though, with this one, that makes me wonder, like, did Remy just know something? Was she kind of in on this somehow and then kind of tipped them off? I don't know, that seems highly suspect. I'd ask her a few more questions if I was them. The high fi deaths that occurred in 1974 are are still a shock today. Three men, Dale Shelby, William Andrews, and Keith Roberts entered the Hi-Fi shop in Ogden, Utah, just before closing time. They then held the store workers, Stanley Walker and Michelle Ainsley hostage in the basement before robbing the store. Later, Brian Naisbitt entered the store as he was running errands and was also taken hostage. Both Byron's mother, Carol Peterson Nesbitt, and Stanley's father, Oren Walker, arrived at the store to look for their 
where they suffered the same fate. They were taken hostage. After this, the hostages were forced to drink a corrosive liquid that caused their lips tongues and throats to burn and the flesh to peel away from their skin. The hours of torment also included the use of a ballpoint pen as a weapon and three of the hostages were shot dead. The two surviving victims, Oren Walker and Byron Nesbitt, sustained permanent life-changing injuries. The twisted criminals were put to death by lethal injection, all except for Keith Roberts, who was charged with aggravated robbery and sentenced to life imprisonment. Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris were a serial slaying duo who ended the lives of five girls in the most sinister way possible. The victims had been kidnapped on the highways of Southern California over a period of five months in 1979. The criminals used an ice pick, screwdriver, vice grips, and pliers to subject them to the worst kind of physical pain. They also recorded the screams of their victims. Retired Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney who prosecuted the two was still haunted by the evidence for years after after the trial saying that I would hear the girls screaming and I was running to go get them and then too late. So the pair sat on death row for decades and ended up dying of natural causes. So one weird thing about death row, like why do people sit on death row for ages? Just like, all right, we're sentencing you to death. Do it. What are they sitting around for? What's the point? Anyway, next up we have the Ripper Crew. The Ripper Crew was a satanic cult and gang who in the 80s abducted and ended the lives of multiple women that ran in the Chicago area until authorities apprehended them. The group consisted of Robert Gecht and three associates, Edward Spritzer and brothers Andrew and Thomas Cocorellis. They were suspected in the deaths of 17 women in Illinois in 1981 and 82, as well as the unrelated fatal shooting of a man in a random drive-by. According to one of the detectives who investigated the case, Gecht made Manson look like a Boy Scout. Thomas Cocorellis was released from prison on March 29th of 2019, just horrifying the victim's families. He served half of his 70 year sentence after pleading guilty. In an interview with WBBM TV, Thomas proclaimed his innocence, saying that everybody thinks I'm a monster, but I'm not a monster. Sylvia and Jenny Lickens were born to two carnival workers who regularly traveled around the country. During one of their parents' trips in 1965, the girls were left in the care of Gertrude Benzweski, who agreed to house them for a weekly $20 payment. But when this money began coming in late, Gertrude took out her anger on on the Lycans girls. Eventually, she directed the extreme mistreatment almost entirely at Sylvia, sometimes to the point of starvation. Sylvia's maltreatment came not only from Gertrude, but also from her children and other neighborhood kids, culminating in Sylvia's tragic death on October 26th of 1965. Police officers found her body laid on a filthy mattress and was covered in more than 150 burns and cuts. It was clear at first that she'd starved to death as she was little more than scared skin and bone. Later it was found that she died of a brain hemorrhage and malnutrition. Gertrude served less than 20 years in prison for some reason. On August 23rd of 2003, Pennsylvania resident Brian Wells delivered his last pizza. At the location of his delivery, Brian allegedly was coerced into strapping an explosive around his neck with instructions to complete four tasks in exchange for his life. The first objective was to shake down a PNC bank, which Brian tried to comply with, but it was not meant to be a harmless stick-up, as the people who affixed the device to Brian gave him a homemade single barrel. He completed the robbery, but the police arrived and arrested him. They handcuffed him, and he desperately explained that he had a bomb around his neck. As police moved away and tried to clear the area, the bomb went off, and Brian died instantly. Inside Brian's car, police found nine pages of handwritten instructions addressed to bomb hostage directing him to rob the bank. The instructions also included a scavenger hunt, listing a series of strictly timed tasks of collecting keys that would delay detonation and eventually defuse the bomb. The pages warned that Brian would be under constant surveillance and any attempts to contact authorities would result 
and the bomb's detonation. Act now, think later, or you will die was also scrawled at the bottom of the instructions. Then, in a complicated investigation, a woman named Marjorie D.L. Armstrong was found responsible for the crime and was sentenced to life in prison, plus 30 years. American justice system, like the court system, is so weird with that kind of thing. It's just, it's life. How do you do more than life? Let me tell you, this last case is disturbing, but also kind of inspiring. On December 18th of 1994, Alison Botha was abducted near her home in South Africa. Her captors later identified as Franz de Toit and Theans Kruger took her to a deserted area on the outskirts of town. There, they took advantage of her, disemboweled her, and slashed her throat so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. They stabbed her at least 30 times in the abdomen. They slit her throat 16 times. Do you think she's dead? One of the attackers asked. No one can survive that, the other replied. Finally, they left her for dead in a clearing, apparently satisfied that they had ended her life. The pair drove away, but little did they know that Allison was still breathing, lying alone atop sand and broken glass. She decided to write the names of her attackers in the dirt knowing that she was gonna pass away. And then beneath that, she wrote, I love mom. In the distance, she could see headlights streaking through the bushes. When she moved towards the headlights, she realized the full extent of her injuries. She pulled herself up and then her head started to fall backwards. Meanwhile, she could also feel something slimy protruding from her abdomen, which were her own intestines. She had to use one hand to keep her organs from spilling out and the other hand to literally hold up her head. As she laid on the road, someone spotted her and she was saved. She was on the brink of death, but actually managed to pull through. She also remembered everything about her attackers. She was soon able to identify them from police pictures while she was still in the hospital. Like that is incredible, absolute hero right there. Mm -hmm.